Welcome to Life with Ghosts, Let's Chat, the show that seeks to better understand how to best communicate with our departed loved ones. I'm your host, Stephen Berkeley. Tonight's guest, Suzanne Wilson. So Gary, have you heard of the term brain spotting? I've heard the term, but I don't know exactly what it entails, but I understand it has something to do with being able to connect with the other side. It's a good guess. So brain spotting belongs in the same category as induced after death communication therapy, as accelerated resolution therapy, as repair and reattachment therapy, in that these therapies all are all derivative of the trauma-based therapy EMDR. They each use a kind of bilateral stimulation to achieve the intended result. So last week, I met a researcher, courtesy of somebody in this community. Um, I met a researcher who uses brain spotting to reconnect to her late husband regularly. Her name is Dr. Lenore Matthew. I'm, I'm dropping her name here because I suspect that Dr. Matthew is going to be an important voice in this field. Her story is very, very moving and inspiring. And I encourage everyone here to visit Dr. Matthew's YouTube video called Evidence of the Afterlife with Dr. Lenore Matthew. We will have a brain spotting instructor talk to us in an upcoming episode, but that's that that video will do for now. So now onto the show. How do I know tonight's guest? So when we finally finished making the film Life with Ghosts, my producer and I decided to send the film to people in the field who were already working in this area and would want to endorse a science-backed documentary about after-death communication. Suzanne Wilson was a well-known medium who had been rigorously tested in double-blind and triple-blind studies and worked closely with Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona on developing the cell phone. So Suzanne was one of the first people we reached out to. And our own, plus our own Gary Langley, had a reading with Suzanne Wilson a while back. Now, Suzanne is here listening, so this could be awkward for you, Gary, <laughs> but could you give us your unvarnished opinion of that reading? How'd it go? Um, do you know the emoji head that explodes? I'm stealing this from sh my friend Cheryl Page. Yes, I know that emoji, and I know Cheryl Page's reference. That's the kind of reading I had. It was mind-blowing. So, but I had some very, very evidential things come through. And it's That's mine. very cool. I think when I asked you about the reading, I think what you said to me was, Suzanne Wilson was the best reading I've ever had. It was. Can I share a little story? Because she won't even remember this. It, I'll keep it brief. The reading I set up was on my 64th birthday. That morning of my 64th birthday, I was having coffee and I asked my phone to play When I'm 64 by the Beatles, which is an old favorite. One of my favorites too. Yeah. So during the reading at two that afternoon, I had not said anything about it being my birthday. I had not said anything about listening to that song. Suzanne says, huh, I'm hearing that Beatles song. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? And I said, guess what? And I started to tell her it was my birthday. She stopped me. She said, I have a little woman coming through bringing that song. And um, I just asked her if she was 64. And she said, no, you, meaning me. She said, I think it's your mother. And I said, I think so too. And she said, five, two, blue eyes, dead on. That was my mother, five foot two with blue eyes. So, and I'm six, three. So you, you know, you're yes. not pulling that out of your hat. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so, great. That's just, uh, <laughs> that, uh, the whole reading was like that and uh, mind blowing. And, that, and that's a good example of evidential, right, Gary? Exactly. So. Fantastic. So we, we've made Suzanne wait long enough. I'm going to do my intro and then we're going to go into the interview. Everybody ready? This is very exciting, by the way, Suzanne. I've been waiting for this for a long time. 
Suzanne Wilson holds a master's degree from Notre Dame de Namur University, from which she graduated summa cum laude and has certifications from Stanford University. She was a Fortune 500 corporate executive until a 2007 near-death experience shifted her focus in a big way. Today, Suzanne is a globally recognized researcher and educator on a wide range of spiritual topics. At one time, Suzanne's waiting list for an individual session topped over 1,000 names. Suzanne, welcome to Life with Ghosts. Let's chat. I would love to chat, and thank you for the invite, Stephen, and thank you for reminding me about that Beatles song, Gary, because just the other day I started hearing that song in my head again, and I'm like, I wonder why that song's starting to be an earworm for me. Well, it's because we're meeting today, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this session. I, I just took it as one of those those signs that tell you, you know, thumbs up, green light, ding, ding, ding. It's going to be a, a good discussion. Okay. Oh. That's great. I love that auspicious start. Fantastic. So Suzanne, here's my first question. At what age did you first realize you were different from the other kids? I hadn't realized it yet, Stephen, but the experiences started at about age five and it was with astral travel. And that was me just trying to get back into the body in the morning after being out on the astral plane. So for those who don't know, you have an astral body or a spiritual body that can leave your physical body, especially when you're sleeping and go out and explore the astral plane. I was doing that without knowing that I was doing that. And a few years later, my mom would say, you know, why do you always say this when she would yelled, Susie, it's time to get up. I would say, mom, I'm still coasting because once I got back in my body, it took me a while to be able to open my eyes. And she finally asked me one day what was coasting. And I told her about the flying around and things I would see. And then shortly after that, I started seeing colors and lights around people. And it was very curious to me. So at, at least stage five. When you saw colors and lights, you didn't know other people were not seeing colors and lights, right? Yeah, there was no comparison with anybody else until I went to Head Start. And Head Start was a program for um, low-income kids just before their kindergarten started. And it was a way to make sure that we got a meal, which I was getting meals, but it was appreciated. And that we would also get a head start going to school because a lot of times with lower income families, the parents are busy working or they have too much going on and they don't learn the basic ABCs and things at home. So I went to the head start class and I started telling the kids their colors and telling the teachers who was standing behind them in the spirit world. And it did not go over well. When you say it didn't go over well, give me a little bit more about that. What happened? I got teased and made fun of and called crazy Susie. And I can remember many times, very ingrained in my memory, being pushed down on an asphalt play playground and skidding my knees and skidding my elbows and nobody wanted to play with me. And uh, it was it was weird, to say the very least. So the, the kids got physical with you. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was very hard. I had to learn how to keep my mouth shut, but I was awfully excited at some of the things that I could see. Every once in a while, there would be another kid that would see what I saw or would know something was true, but you know, they were smarter than me in terms of getting along and socializing and didn't say much about it. So how long were you in the closet? Oh, gosh. I kept it really secret until the near-death experience in 2007, which was hard to do, but I wanted to be taken seriously in my career. And I don't have a real good uh, poker face. If somebody would talk about um, you were, I saw you at a seminar or workshop about psychic abilities or something like that. I don't think I could just change the subject or cover it up. So I would go out of town and get my trainings. I sat in development circle and I kept it very secret with just a couple of friends knowing about my abilities, but I was working on them. 
And 2007, the near-death experience was what made me realize this is my life. It can't just be a hobby and it changed my priorities. I, I do want to talk about the NDE, but I want to ask you one more question about your experience as a child. Even though you weren't coming out of the closet and telling everyone you were doing this, were you regularly, you said you were, you were, you were working on your mediumship or your psychic abilities before you came out, but were you also just enjoying the spirit world, spirit friends? Were you having interactions growing up with people nobody else could see? Growing up was the best part. And I will tell you also my intuitive abilities saved me one time from SA, sexual abuse. When I was nine or 10 years old, there was a, a man who was a distant relative in the family and he was trying to get me alone with him uh, off to where nobody else could see. And I got this glimpse of him uh, trying to put his hand inside my clothing before it even happened. And later on, we would find out that he was an abuser, but I got away. And so I started to realize very, very young. And then I've only told that to a couple of people, never in an interview before, but I had to think about it because recently you asked me about how my childhood would have been different. And I've been thinking about, man, it just really saved me a few times, but it would also, the abilities would give me information that I didn't necessarily want to have, like seeing uh, a teacher and knowing they had cancer because I would see it like something dark and stormy. I call it dark and stormy uh, around their body and I could tell what it was. And there's no way that a, a, a small child could go up and make that announcement, but I would, I would tell somebody and that would be my grandfather. So it was, I would say it was a really double-edged sword to have the abilities as a child in the, in the one way you, you get a heads up, but in another way, yeah. It, it makes you feel responsible. Yeah. And I would also think it must have felt so isolating. Isolating, yes. I was really, really fortunate to have my granddad help me out. But with other kids, I another thing I remember recently was that there was a neighbor kid that she was into talking about astral travel. And I had a book by somebody. And it's in the 70s. And the, the book talked about how to astral travel. I don't remember if it was Robert Monroe, probably was. I don't know who else was writing about it then. But we sat down outside and we read it together. And we arranged to meet each other in the backyard during astral travel when we slept that night. Well, I did the astral travel. And I went in the backyard. And she wasn't there. And the next day she came over and I said, hey, you weren't there last night. I was there and I waited for you for a long time. And she said, oh, I forgot. And then never tried it again. And I'm like, well, all right. So then I found some other kids in grade school and I asked them if they wanted to contact some of these spirit people or help me with them. And all these kids wanted to do was play Bloody Mary go in a bathroom. I, I'll bet some people hearing this know this little game, go in the bathroom and say, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, and look in the mirror and scare the crap out of yourself and all the other kids. And like, man, that's not what it's about either. So when you say it was isolating and lonely, yeah, it was isolating and lonely. But I had always in my mind, there's going to be a time where I'm going to use this. There's going to be a time where I'm going to use this. I just have to be patient. Yeah. And you say something as a refrain that I, before we go further into the interview, as your refrain, you will say repeatedly, that's what a refrain is, um, don't let one person be your expert, right? Could you speak to that a little bit? Because it really, just last month, I kind of gave a little bit of a sermon about this, but I had no, I, I didn't have you to back me up. I want you, you could back me up right now. Well, I've had people say to me, Suzanne, you sound like maybe you're not comfortable in your own competencies when you say that education and, and spirituality and what you know about the world comes from your experience and the experiences of others. So sample all of that, pay attention to all of that. Shouldn't they just pay attention to just their own experiences and what you're teaching? And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not collecting 
people. And I think teachers who uh, issue your reading other people's books or are very protective of you and want you just to do everything with them are, are collecting you, not empowering you. And to put that into a positive spin, the idea of go, coming to earth, coming to earth to have experiences and to learn and then integrate those experiences and use that to create wisdom. Everybody on earth is doing that. Why not learn from other people about their outlook on life, how they monitor their thoughts, words, and actions, what their theory of everything is or their theory of compassion is, and then synthesize all of that information plus your own experiences and create something unique and beautiful yourself for your guide to living uh, the best life as the best human being you can be. To say, I follow this teacher or I follow that teacher. I hope that when folks say that, they're, they mean on social media, I'm a follower on social media, because to be a follower and to make that person uh, who's walking the earth now your guru, you're walking the earth now too. You are your own guru. I love that. Thank you so much, Suzanne. So you mentioned in 2007, you had a near-death experience. You were working towards your PhD when you went somewhere to get tested for allergies. And one of the allergens administered to you to test your tolerance sent you into anaphylaxis, essentially killing you. You described your near-death experience explicitly on the Jeff Mara podcast, which can be found on YouTube, which I recommend for those interested in hearing those details. But to sum it up here, it was not a pleasant experience, and it left you with the uncanny ability to see things you did not necessarily want to see, right? It's a mixed experience. I'm not going to say that it was wholly pleasant or unpleasant. It was life-changing, but that's because I chose how I would synthesize and incorporate that experience into my life. And I had to make some mistakes in that process. But I stepped out of the body and my throat had been honking like a goose. And I remember taking my last breath. And when my heart slowed down and stopped, it was like a train slowing down and coming to a final stop. And then the train usually jerks back just a little bit. And when I went back, I popped out of the body. Now, what I what happened then out of the body was amazing. It was beautiful. I saw beautiful colors and music and felt the arms of my mentor, the closest person in my life, my granddad, who had passed much earlier. And I wanted to go to where those colors were emanating, where that music was being made. And I didn't get the chance to do that. But the aftermath of it was not a bed of roses by any means. I didn't come back instantly changed. I came back confused. And as you said, all uh, every time I talk about it, I'm like, Ugh. Um, all those abilities that I had been honing and practicing in terms of clairaudience, clairvoyance, clairsentience, claircognizance, all of the clairs, all of it that I naturally had and I had been working on tuning in and doing it better. They were on full force now. I think that touching the other side in such a direct and visceral manner just put me in so much contact and removed all barriers that um, I, I was living a haunted kind of life. And it wasn't that I was seeing things that scared me so much as those darn spirit people can scare the crap out of you and they don't mean to, but they were following me all the time. Uh, I watched this movie again, not too long ago with Ricky Gervais, where he has a near death experience in surgery and they don't tell him. And now he's open to the spirit world. And then it's like they're running around and they're following him and he's hiding. And I basically lived that. And it wasn't as funny. It wasn't funny at all. It was getting in the way of everything. 
And so I did go back to one of the teachers that I had been studying with to get connected better and to do a better job at all of this and said, what do I do now? And he started working with me. And finally, one day he said, did you ever just stop and ask them what do they want? <laughs> what a novel idea. I can just ask them what do they want rather than say, oh, put up your barriers, send them away. I mean, all that stuff that I was trying to do. No, I started asking them what they want. Most of them just wanted to be seen. And then I started getting really empowered with it. But um, I would drink heavily for months just to shut it all down. And Let me stop you there, Suzanne. So you kind of were Haley Joe Osmond from The Sixth Sense. You were seeing <laughs> dead people. Another movie that I like to watch um, once in a while. Yeah, and it, but they were physically interactive, some of them. And what I came to learn, Stephen, is they're using our energy. So I'm highly charged anyway, because from a childhood, I've been this very charged up, big aura person, and they can see this light. And we've all had that in some incarnation in our lives. Maybe you have it now, maybe you had it last time or next time. Well, they're seeing all of that, and they used it to move things. Like I, I would have doors open and slam, and not just poltergeist type not poltergeist per se but the spirit people could get real physical they could throw things at me to get my attention nothing that would hurt me but I, it was i would be very drained afterwards and it so was at just, least at first this was unwanted attention you were getting that and is I'm, correct and i'm going to say this on behalf of the i'm saying this for the men in the audience now this, this audience is 90 percent women so i think everyone here could probably say they understand what it feels like to get unwanted attention. Men don't really know that. I mean, they're, they know it, but they're not really cognizant of it. Women are having a completely different experience on the planet just because of that fact. Would you agree with that, Suzanne? 100%. I heard someone say once that um, men are afraid that women will laugh at them and women are afraid that men will kill them. Oh my God, yes. So. First of all, I feel I empathize with all women for that reason, as my, in addition to many others. Um, that's really sad. And here you are now getting unwanted attention from beings that you don't, you can't really, they don't have a physical address. They don't have a, they don't have a form. So that must have been, I mean, you're being somewhat brave when you're talking about it right now, but that must have been terrifying. I would, you, you know what, the... The memories don't fade because I, for the first time in my life, it wasn't even terror. It was a complete realization that I have control over nothing. And if that's what it took to get me to understand that on the earth plane, we don't control anything but our own actions, I, I'll tell you, it worked. Wow. So Suzanne, you said you... You, you wanted to repress it. You want, you started drinking, I think you said a moment ago. Um, did that work? Yes, it worked fine, but it wasn't healthy at all. And I would have to, I would just, just the minute I got home from my job is when I would hit it. And then all weekend and, and um, I didn't feel well because I hadn't been uh, a big drinker before, but I didn't know what else to do. And I was thinking life as I know it is over. And why did I go to all of those classes and development groups when it was here all along? And now what do I do with it? So uh, what empowered me was just instantly saying, yep, I see you. What do you want? What can I do for you? And, and then say no, if there was a request that I couldn't handle. Uh, and then I also realized, wait, this is really going to be good because at some point I could probably teach people how to tune in, how to tune out. And I could probably help people with their boundaries. And I'm doing, as you said, I was in the PhD program while working a, a lot of hours every week. I was in a weekend PhD program in human resources development, which is human capital, um, managing high performance teams, strategy. And I thought, well, you really want to teach someday maybe you'll teach this and i look back on that now and i'm like god all of these experiences were so important 
and it, and I think that's true for a lot of us. The things we think were awful or the thing, things that we think were a waste of time all have like this cumulative effect in our life as, of making us who we are. Wow. Very good. So do you think your near-death experience was a necessary step to where you are now? Or could, could you have, or could people in general, could they develop that kind of ability? I liked money and power and things probably a little too much and needed to have a wake up call. That's my theory. And, you know, eventually be teaching adjunct faculty in a university because I come from academe too. And so I thought, well, I'm setting myself up for a nice retirement and a second home and all of that. And something needed to get my attention and say, you're not using a unique gift in the way that it's intended. And I was being a bit of a late bloomer. I mean, this only happened a few years ago. 2007 is not that long ago when you consider I've been around for a while and I had been a psychic kid. But again, I'm not trying to make myself feel better. I really feel like I had to be a late bloomer on these abilities because all my life experiences have made me a very well-rounded person. When the spirit world gives me an image in my mind, I can I can place it better. I have the language for it. I mean, I, I've got I'm I'm well traveled. I, I've read quite a bit. I've talked to a lot of people. I've had to be in positions in boardrooms and that sort of thing. And it's been very very helpful. But I've also been humbled and um, been the idiot that didn't know what they were doing and didn't have a sense of self-worth. And um, I think all of those experiences are very important. I think a lot of people listening can relate to some of this. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, Suzanne, that this all happened at the exact right time. Well, you, you could have a point there. Uh, it, it, I have in my mind late bloomer all of the time. And I think I hang on to that because people recognize it. The, the point is, aren't we all just blooming in place wherever we are? No matter what choice I had made, if I had just chosen to stay with that role in that company, finished the PhD program, um, retired and done my professor thing, I probably still would have found a way to spread the information I want to share with people but I would have probably impacted a lot fewer people. Now I can be on mission. Very good. That's fantastic news for the rest of us. So we said earlier about your refrain, and now it's my refrain too. Don't let one expert, one person be your expert. Don't let one person be your expert. Read, ex experience, what was the last one? Read, experience, something else was in your refrain. <laughs> um, process and explore wisdom. Yeah, it, it, you create wisdom through your own experiences, the ex hearing about the experiences of others and seeing you know, what's po possible and then synthesizing all of that and integrating it. That's where wisdom comes from. So if you stay in a bubble and only look at one way of being, you're missing out on some growth. Right. I found the quote because I wrote it down after I heard you speak at uh, <laughs> helping, par helping Parents Heal. You said, don't let one person be your expert. Explore, read, and experience for yourself. Love yeah. that quote. So like when you, that. When, <laughs> it sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> so when you give talks about the afterlife, where is that information coming from? My higher self that's always in touch with the other side my soul self, my guides are always around me. They'll help shape words. And I have a group of guides that are with me. I, I, I don't channel the guides so much where I could say, uh, let's go to Unity Church next Tuesday at five and they'll show up. I don't know that I can do that. That part hasn't been my calling for some people. It is their calling, but they guide me and they have helped me be in the right time at the right place with the right words. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for having the wisdom inside of us. 
It doesn't necessarily have to come from outside of us. And in most cases, it comes from our higher selves, our soul self, that part of us that is in both worlds. I, I don't think all of us, I don't think we're all here, Stephen. <laughs> I think there's a big part of all of us that is in the dimension from which we came and to which we will return our, our true home. Yeah, I, I could imagine that. You know, when I think of the spirit world and I think of my higher self, I kind of think of kind of like, you know, like like a puppeteer, but that sounds crass. Not a puppet, some, a better word for puppeteer, but someone's above me that's kind of looking out for me and somewhat giving me messages. Is and, that it's you you. and it's and you. It's, me. it's the bigger me. You become a, a, a great storyteller and a great director and um, your heart has continues to be open and has been open and you're synthesizing a lot of information for people so that they don't have to go and do it themselves but they can take it in you're another source another gift well thank you suzanne i'm, I'm writing that down too <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite thing to ask on this program is for for tips uh, just to help me and everyone in the in my community learn how we could just connect better. Okay, and let I, me I, ask you a question. Okay. Have you ha ever had a dream visit from a loved one in spirit yourself? I've had one and I can't wait for the next one. Okay, was it short or long? It was relatively short, but the most palpable thing I've ever experienced. Okay, there's a, we did not set this up, <laughs> I promise you. But one of the first things that you can ask for is contact through the dream state. I remember earlier, guys, when I talked about being out on the astral plane, no specific talent is required to do that. And our loved ones in spirit can make a connection with us. But listen to Stephen, it's going to be surprisingly short and amazingly realistic because it is realistic. If your dream visit goes on and on, if it could have a director and credits, no offense, Stephen. Um, <laughs> and it's like a movie or, you know, everything's weird or it's not their personality and they're acting weird. That's just a dream. Or maybe that's something you ate the night before. But the dream visit itself is short, sweet. It's their personality. Typically, their lips will not move because it's mind to mind, heart to heart. And so you can invite that dream visit. And one of the ways to do that is pick one night a week. Mine is Sunday. I have kind of like a open mic night for dream visits on Sunday. I like that. Yeah. And I drop in on Sunday afternoon, anybody that wants to, um, in my family, my people, my pets. And think of them. Put a little sticky note on your mirror that's got their name. And every time, you know, you brush your teeth or get a drink of water, you're you're saying, hey, remember, I'm asked, I'm inviting you into my dream tonight. Leave a bowl of water by your bed. Water is a great spiritual conductor. It helps with the energy. It doesn't have to be a fancy bowl or a certain crystal or anything like that. Maybe have their picture or, or an object that they owned if you have it. If you don't, it's fine. And when you go to sleep, just pull up a memory that makes you really happy that you experienced with that loved one and fall asleep playing that memory. That's the last thing as you're falling asleep. It's okay if your mind goes to the grocery list or tomorrow's to-dos for a minute, bring it back, go to sleep with that memory. When you first wake up in the morning, ask yourself, close your eyes again. What happened last night? And it comes like really, really fast. And, and if it's not there, try it again the next week and the next week and the next week. After you've done it four or five weeks, you can give it a rest or go to another person. But for a lot of people, this pays off or what can happen is they come through a different way because you've, you've summoned them, you've invited them. And people say, oh, I don't want to summon the spirits. I don't want to, I don't want to bug them. You're not bugging them. We are their heaven too. Another way is to meet in meditation and you choose a place and you build it in your mind. It's real helpful if it's a place that you both did actually go to before. And see it, hear it, feel it, smell it, and set an appointment. Close your eyes and get there a few minutes before the appointment and just wait. And for a lot of people, they're like, well, I imagined them, but I don't know if it was real. Same thing with the dream visit. At first, it'll, they'll just come in quick. Your eyes may be closed or you may be looking at a fixed point in the room where you're meeting them. 
and something flashes in your mind and they're there, please let that quick connection be okay because you can build upon it. Now, I actually wrote a book with lots of other tips in it several years ago. People are still buying it. Um, it's called Soul Smart, What the Dead Teaches About Spirit Communication. But I have a lot of this stuff just for free on my YouTube channel. I think we just, my, my granddad, who was a preacher, used to say, we live so far beneath our privileges as children of a loving God. It is a privilege that you have if you want if you want, and you're willing to accept it and you're open to it, to make your own direct connection. Oh, that's fantastic news because here I've just been waiting, hoping that it would happen again, and you're giving me the steps. So thank you so much. I'm so glad yeah. I asked that question. <laughs> It'll work. You made a video, I, th I think, called The ABCs of ADC. Yes. Are there other things in that video, like little tips yes. that you can give us? Yes, there's there's actually quite a lot in there. And um, it is the ABCs. It's step by step. But one of the things I have found is a lot of folks want some kind of uh, grounding and a foundation in after death communications, because believe it or not, Stephen, this surprised me, but in surveying community members that I've had over the years, when they a lot of them, when they first come, they're scared. They're scared something's going to startle them. It's like, okay, I want to contact my husband on the other side, but I'm afraid he'll scare me and I'm living alone or something like that. This stuff happens. Or they've been told that they could be tricked by demons. Somebody with a different belief system has told them you shouldn't be messing with the dead. Let them rest in peace like they're resting. Oh, my God. They're resting. They have more fun than we do a lot of the times. I'm just saying. I'm not kidding you either. Now, now stay here on Earth until it's your rightful time to go. But they have a really good time and they are not resting in peace. So a lot of beginners will say, I want this and I don't want this. I want the direct contact but I'm scared. And when you look at the different kinds of ADCs, what I did in, in that presentation in that deck is I have just built a little bit on the amazing groundwork that Bill and Judy Guggenheim laid out in their um, book, Hello from Heaven, seminal book. I've given away um, cases of that book over the years. So when you look at, and please read that book if you haven't already, I'm pretty sure that um, Gary featured it in the book club a while back. And anyway, taking their work and how they categorized after death communications or ADCs, I've added on that for um, the 2020s and the new ways. And we have unilateral ADCs and bilateral ADCs. The unilateral is you know, both sides are reaching out at the same time. And that can work for a lot of people that meeting and meditation, requesting and being open to the dream visit. For example, um, recording electronic voice phenomena, but there's also uh, unilateral where it's just the spirit making the initiation of the communication. And what they've been doing is um, a lot more in, in this day and age of using electronics unilaterally you don't know this is going to happen and all of a sudden your screensaver turns itself on and it's a picture of your loved ones in spirit and you're like how did that happen or all of a sudden um alexa is saying play blah 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 song play when i'm 64 by the beatles and you're like who did that you know so they're doing a lot more things like that they're very technologically savvy, aren't they? Yeah, you know, they're so much, so much, so much, so much. And I get really excited because I can feel my guides being like supercharged about this, about how hard and happily and diligently the folks on the other side, the souls are working to use every single thing that they can. So if you knew all the different ways that they can communicate, you, you won't miss it when it happens. And that's why I, I made that deck and that, that um, recording. Very good. Now, 
we're approaching close to the end of the hour, and I want to make sure that the audience has an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm going to turn the show over to Gary in just a moment. First, I want to find out what can we expect for Earth's future, do you think? Do you know? I've been on this a lot, uh, starting with did the spirit people know uh, about COVID? And the answer that I got about that was yes, because they can see it being built in the quantum field. They can see what's coming here a little bit before it happens. And whether people believe in this or not, the fact is that we are co-creating what happens in our world, whether it's um, bliss and harmony or it's war and destruction. And so they can see what we're doing in the, there are um, opposing forces as always that are creating in the quantum field. But the main thing I've been hearing is that earth is going through a cycle. Humankind is going through a cycle. We've been here before, we'll be here again. We're not going away. The earth is not ending, humanity is not ending, but humanity as we know it now is changing. And those of us that are here right now, apparently we all signed up for this. I've, I've tested this hypothesis any way that I can think of. Like, did some of us just sort of get sent here against our will? And it always turns out from reliable sources from the spirit world and interdimensional that, yeah, you can't be here right now doing this big cycle shift unless you signed up for it. So it's really, really, really important that each individual monitors his or her thoughts, words, and actions for compassion for self and compassion for others so that what we're creating in the quantum field isn't a fear-based product. And if we let our imaginations run away with us in the worst case scenario, we actually give power to the creation of what we don't want. The universe doesn't hear the negatives. It just hears uh, war, uh, inflation, um, poverty, and all those sorts of things. So we have to do the best that we can to change that. However, it is a rough ride. We're already in a rough ride. I'm not going to be Pollyanna here and say, oh, it's a magical year and things are changing and shifting and it's just going to be wonderful in paradise on earth. Yes, that is coming. That is coming. But that is a cycle and it's going to take some time and we all have our parts to do. Start with yourself, compassion in your thoughts, words, and actions for yourself, and it gets easier to have that for other people. You want to be more intuitive? Be kind. <laughs> Kindness plugs you into the universal consciousness, the, the, the good matrix. It makes you more intuitive, helps you make better choices, helps you stay away from an event that is happening during this cycle that you don't want to be a part of. So, um yeah, that does sound kind of silly that kindness can save the world, but it actually can. Fabulous. Okay, Suzanne, here's the last question before I turn it over to Gary for a Q&A. Where can people find you? What's Carefree your website? Medium. Carefree yep. Medium. Carefree Medium. Carefreemedium.com. And my handle on um, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and um, TikTok is Carefree Medium. I'm also around. I know I've seen the hashtag intuition educator uh, because I do readings. I've taken time away before from doing individual sessions. I do two, two types, one for evidential mediumship, like what Gary described, and another for ask your spirit guides. And I, I am doing those again. What's really fun right now is doing the small groups, which for some people, it gets them to put a toe in, into getting a reading. There are only seven people and they all get um, messages. Um, I want to do more writing and I've been doing a bit of traveling. Well, here's a fun thing I do. You guys, I want you guys to try this next time you go to a new place. I want you to put your hands on the wall, get yourself grounded and centered first, but put your hands on the walls of this place. Say it's an old church or a beautiful building or wherever you go and tune into the energy there. I've been, I've done recently Egypt, uh, Turkey, Istanbul, and London, Spain, and Portugal. And I love doing the place memory exercises everywhere. You tune into history, you might find a past life. Um, it's just, there's just so much going on. I have a satsang group that meets every few weeks too, where we have an hour 
of um, study like this. And we have an hour of Q&A about anything you want to ask. So we're always changing. We're always just um, morphing with your needs. Very good. Suzanne, thank you so much for being here tonight. That was very informative and very enlightening. And I just, I just really appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to seeing what people want to talk about now. Gary.